Peace family, welcome to African Esquire TV. I'm your host, Tierney Cherie. Before I get started, please do like, comment, and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. But please also add yourself to my Telegram channel. Telegram is a decentralized platform, and the link to that is inside of the description and inside of the pinned comment. In addition, please add yourself to my channel on Odyssey. It is a decentralized version of YouTube. The link to that is also in the pinned comment and inside of my description. What we're going to talk about today is the crisis going on in the Congo. That's always going to be a big subject whenever you're talking about African liberation, because in my opinion, the Congo is probably the most under siege territory inside of the African experience. And the reason is because of the mineral wealth of the Congo and the fact that so many companies, so many corporations, so many nations rely on this particular part of the world. It's no coincidence that this particular part of the world, while they have all the wealth, the people are the poorest in the world. And that right there should tell you that something's not right. That right there should tell you that someone is involved inside of this. And this, this cannot just be a corrupt politician. This can't just be, yo, we need accountability. There is something specifically wrong in the global scheme. The fact that countries that do not have mineral resources are rich and the countries that have all the mineral resources are poor. And this is one of the horrible, horrible atrocities that has happened to our people because it really kills every single day so many Africans. Don't think because it's not a war plane or because it's not a bomb. Don't think because it's not grenades and it's not machine, uh, mach machine guns. Don't think because it's not visible like that, that neocolonialism is not just as violent. Killing a people slowly through poverty, through hunger, through starvation, that is violent. Killing a people by malnutrition, by putting them inside of situations where they're getting diseases, that is violent. And until we understand that violence as being just as reprehensible as the violence that we see and recognize as violence, until we do that, we will not be able to emancipate ourselves because we won't take the situation that is presented for our people as being something that is a state of emer emergency. So with that being said, I wanna talk about some more of what's going on. In clashes going on inside of the Congo and typically these clashes get blamed on extremism. You hear it as Islamic militants coming into a territory and these are the people who are causing all this havoc. The reason why that analysis is very lazy to me is because number one, if you're looking at what they're doing as extremism, what drove these people to do such extreme things? What drove these people into being inside of, it's basically like the same thing as if you're inside of America or a Western country, like we'll say gangs, what drove those people into being gangs? It's very easy to blame gang violence as being the perpetrator as far as the violence in your neighborhood. But a closer analysis says people don't join these groups just for the fun of it. People don't join these groups because they feel like it's going to lead to a long life. Many times you join these groups understanding that you have completely put your life in danger for some type of way out. And that's the only reason why these things happen. We put people inside of a place where they're economically constrained and they don't have any other way out. And that is where you see extremism, where you see the West inflicting violence on African people and they don't have a way out. That is where you see extremism. Now, one thing that we don't look at though as what causes this extremism is that we're not attributing it to the root cause. Again, I mentioned neocolonialism, but we don't understand this as a real and present reality. Understand the many children that you see in the Congo who are starving, who don't have a dollar, who don't have anything. Some of them have been driven to mines and, and get paid cents a day to give us these technologies. Whether you're watching me on a cell phone, a computer, whether you jump in your car and you go to work, these children are being worked for these little bit of cents a day, or their parents are, or the community is. People also have to keep in mind actively 
that there are people who are taking these resources directly from the people who need it the most. And that is the most barbaric thing, I think, because it's one thing to see that these people um, are obviously inside of a position of being vulnerable to outside interference, but it's another thing to see that even when they starve, these outsiders have no deference to the fact of their, starva their starvation, so to the point that they will get rich and know that they're getting rich and know that they're killing people because of their enrichment. And they take that money and they don't think about it. Not, not another thought comes to their mind. They're happy with the situation. They're happy with this global order that exists. And keep that in mind, people, if you're thinking that you're going to go to the United Nations and you're going to get uh, countries who are benefiting from the current system to change the system, understand that they love this system as it exists. They love the way that it works. If people are so upset about the Security Council, in fact, that they vetoed um, initiatives to try to stop the onslaught of violence against Palestinians inside of Palestine, they love it this way. They're not going to change it. People want the Security Council to reform. Why would they reform it? You have five countries that have a veto power that basically constrains every single country in the world. Why would they change that when they love it? So I wanna talk about this specific story as a very good example. This is, says the DRC, in, in the DRC, $4 billion lost from dubious contracts with an Israeli businessman. And keep in mind, when you're talking about $4 billion, Think about the billion, what that billion dollars could have done to the children who are starving, even if you just distributed it. Imagine what type of reversal of situation that would have done. But yet one person, one businessman gets to take that and run. It says the Democratic Republic of the Congo may have lost nearly $4 billion as a result of dubious mining and oral contracts signed with Israeli businessman Dan Gertler, a coalition of NGOs estimated in a report that was released on Wednesday. Analysis of financial data shows that between 2003 and 2021, the DRC lost $1.95 billion in revenue, said the Anti-Corruption Coalition. Um, if nothing is done to stop this hemorrhage, an additional $176 billion in royalties could escape the state coffers between 2021 and 2039. Um, um, the DRC could be deprived of at least $3.71 billion as a result of these dubious contracts with Dan Gertler, a leading figure in the Congolese mining sector. Here's why I told you people. Um, no person can participate in this mining sector and be a good person or be a person of moral values because this minor sector is very barbaric. And one thing that we'll point out with this is that is Mr. Gertler going to face any criminal prosecution for robbing millions and hundreds of millions of people of something that could save their lives? No, capitalism doesn't uh, does not criminalize. Thievery. It does not criminalize people who have a monopoly on resources. It does not criminalize people who can be poor while the others are, or who could be rich while the others are poor, which is why we should understand that we're being handed something that is completely default to begin with. If anything, uh, taking things with, while other people starve, that should be a criminal act inside of the eyes of us. And I think most poor people, most disadvantaged people, most struggling people would agree. It's also important to note that the new president of Congo, Felix, and I'm going to take my time on his name, Tashikedi, he has not taken any steps to investigate Mr. Gertler's mining transactions. Um, this is keeping in mind the fact that he's been marketed by the West, in my opinion, as being someone who's going to do right by the people of Congo who suffered under Joseph Kabila. And unfortunately, whenever we talk about a new per new president, we talk about a new individual. We're not talking about a new system. And if the system's going to remain the same, understand people, the results are going to remain the same. No matter how much they can dress it up or make it look cute and make it look presentable, colonialism is still colonialism. Colonialism under Joe Biden, for example, is colonialism under Donald Trump. He's more dressed up, he's more presentable, people like him more, but it's still colonialism. The takeaways of this is that we have to understand that our people are completely inside of a state of war, continually inside of a state of war. And until we understand that this war is not going to be eradicated through us feeling bad, it's not going to be eradicated through us reposting things, it's not going to be eradicated through us pointing the fingers at the administration inside of Congo and saying, oh, you need accountability. It's only going to be 
um, eradicated by first the people of Congo being able to mount an effective defense of this. And an effective defense has to be a revolutionary change. And until that happens, unfortunately, our people are going to suffer. The things that we can do to support our people, in my opinion, or continue to ensure that these horrible barbaric acts are receiving the attention, continue to uh, communicate with people who are on the ground or connected to those on the ground, and continue to draw parallels, not between these little scapegoat arguments that this is just something that the president of Congo should have done better on. This is something that the system was designed to do and meant to do. And until we're ready to address the system directly, let's understand we're always going to get the same results. That is all I have on this video. I'd love to hear your comments. I will see you all in the next video. Hey family, this is Tierney Cherie. I'm here to make an announcement that I'm very, very excited to make. I'm excited because I really think this is something that is important for our people. Otherwise, I would not have devoted so much time and energy towards it. So I finished my first book and the book title is Fostering False Identity, The Child Welfare System's Design of Social Control of the Black Family. Now, why is this book something that I think will be very important for our community? Well, number one, it's dealing with the system of white supremacy, particularly the way that the system has targeted our children. If you don't know, our children are literally our future. Without our children, we have no future. And so understand that the system is very crafty when figuring out what to derail first. And to me, it's no mistake that the system particularly went after the black family. If you look at what happened whenever we were enslaved by this system and continues to go against the black, go after the black family, continues to go after black children, continues to try to villainize African parents. So for that, I wanted to particularly talk about this subject. Now, the other thing that the, that the uh, book will deal with is our African identities. Why is it that our African identities are a threat to the system? Why is it that whenever we want to identify ourselves as being African, can we get so much drawback inside of the black community? I think a lot of us are not aware of the history of assimilationist thought inside of our community, this idea that we have to be close to white in order to be accepted. And so that's another subject that we delve into in this book. So I'm hoping that anyone who is, obviously if you're a parent, a black parent and you really want to understand why it is that these systems are going after your children, I encourage you to read this book. I hope that it will arm you with a lot of knowledge and a lot of foresight, not just about how to protect your own children, but how to organize in your community, because that's really the purpose of the book, is to say that we have to organize among ourselves in order to protect ourselves from this white supremacist system. And then obviously, if you're an organizer in general, this is something that I think is important for you to read, because like I said, so like I, this is a subject in the black community that we just don't discuss enough. Um, child welfare is not something that is going to get enough attention. People, obviously, we organize them around other causes, but this is one that is really important that I feel like we have to pay more attention to.